webinar. Oh, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes to get logged in um, and then we will get the show on the road. Um, for those of you that are here right now, this shirt um, that is tacked up on my bookshelf is from the pre-order campaign or from like the, the web store uh, for this book. It says, women want me Co I Jake, I can't pronounce that, but there's, it's like a fossil fish. Um, I'm not good at pronouncing things. Uh, it's the women want me fish for me, but for this book. And we're very excited about that. Um, Sela can, Sela can, there we go. <laughs> Jake messaged me. Um, we'll give another moment, but we are so, so excited for this event. I'm so excited. My cat is even excited. It's going to be great. Okay. So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lainey Rose and I am the events coordinator here at East City Bookshop, a women-owned community-focused indie bookstore located right at the heart of the nation's capital. We are just a few blocks away from the U.S. Capitol building and the Library of Congress and we are so excited to be with you all tonight. Before we get started, we have just a couple of housekeeping things. We will have time for questions at the end, so if you have a question that you would love to ask, please put it in the Q&A box so we can easily see them. We would love to hear from you, though, so put your general enthusiasm in the chat. Tell us where you're streaming in from. Tell us what your favorite fossil is. Like, just all of your screeching can go in the chat box, and then all of your questions go in the Q&A feature. And if you have any technical difficulties, my colleague Emma is monitoring the chat and can help if there are any issues. And finally, if you need to purchase a copy of How to Excavate a Heart or Fresh, you can shop on our website at eastcitybookshop.com and we do ship anywhere in the country. And now the reason we're here. I first heard about How to Excavate a Heart because a friend of mine read the advanced reader's copy and then texted me, reading this book was like hanging out with you. As someone who loves the holidays, Washington, D.C., corgis and lesbians, there was really no way that I wasn't going to love it. And sure enough, I read it, loved it, made it my personality and had to make Jake my friend. This book is also a personal favorite for me because I'm someone who came out in college and having the representation of college age queer folks is something that we absolutely need more of. And I wish I could have given this book to my college self, but I'm so grateful that it exists right now. Jake Maya Arlo delivers a lesbian Jewish twist on the classic Christmas rom-com, and it starts when Shawnee runs into May, like literally, with her mom Subaru, which is so on brand. Attempted vehicular manslaughter was not part of Shawnee's plan. She was supposed to be focusing on her month-long Smithsonian internship. She was going to spend all of her time thinking about dead fish and not all about how she was dumped days before winter break. But when a dog walking gig puts her back in May's paths, the fossils she's meant to be diligently studying are pushed to the side along with the breakup. Though they're, And then they're snowed in together on Christmas Eve, and as things start to feel more serious, Shawnee's hurt over her ex-girlfriend's rejection comes rushing back. Is she ready for a committed relationship again, or is she okay with this just being a passing winter fling? Our author of the evening is Jake Maya Arlo, who is a Stonewall Honor author, podcast producer, and a bagel connoisseur. She studied evolutionary bi biology and creative writing, not as different as you would think, at Barnard College. She lives with her girlfriend and their loud cat in the Pacific Northwest. Her first novel, Almost Flying, was a Stonewall Honor book and a Barnes & Noble Children's Prize shortlist selection. And her debut YA novel, How to Excavate a Heart, is an indie next pick and has already taken the world by storm. Joining us in conversation tonight is another dear friend of mine and author of Messy College Sapphics, the legendary Margot Wood, who is the founder of Epic Reads and has worked in marketing for more than a decade at publishing houses both big and small. She's a graduate of Emerson College and has once appeared as an extra in the Love, Simon movie. I am now going to turn it over to these two lovely folks who I adore with my whole heart, and I am so, so excited for the conversation. Please welcome two of the loves of my life. And y'all... <laughs> Have a great time. <laughs> hey, wow, Lainey, thank you for that introduction. That was beautiful. I know, I feel like a rock star over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jake, I am so incredibly honored to be part of your big launch week. This oh. is like so exciting. I mean, you're not a debut novelist, but you're new to YA and this True. is just 
want to walk you, welcome you with open arms to yeah. this wonderful community. And we're so, so excited to have your book out in the world. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going to plug in my headphones and okay. me, just because I'm having a little. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We're good. All right. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to be here with you. We're both in the Pacific Northwest, which is exciting. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I know. I need to get up to Seattle and come see you at your store. Please. Because you're please. also a bookseller. I'm a bookseller. I'm an author. I'm a cat owner. Um, and, and the podcast, is... you've got okay. like slash, 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 slash. I got so a, a, lot of, a lot of hyphens, sort yeah. of a triple threat bookseller, writer, podcast producer. <laughs> you know what they say. <laughs> That's very exciting. Do you want to show your book? Get it up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, here we go. We got How to Excavate a Heart. Ooh, Yay! she's washed out. <gasps> there we go. <laughs> there she is. Look how beautiful. Influencer, like I have to hold my hand behind it to get people to see it. <laughs> so for anybody who's tuning in and may not be familiar with your book um, and how it all came together, I love, Lainey, thanks for reading the description about it, but like- Yes. <laughs> A, like lesbian Jewish Christmas yes. rom com fossils, the Smithsonian. Like yes. there's so many corgis. Like corgis. Tell me, how did this come together? How did this come to be? Okay, yes. First of all, I ha I do have all those things represented on my clothes as well because I've got my uh, women fear me, fish want me hat, a little corgi pin that my uh, I think it's the yeah the deep time exhibit uh, at the Smithsonian, which takes a part in the book and a dino mug so got all that here um all my little tchotchkes lined up um but yeah how the question was how did it how why how, how? yeah how <laughs> did this story come together like okay. where what what was like what started for you first yeah. was it the relation like was it shiny yeah. was it the setting like what I was think, the spark yeah I was kind of talking about this yesterday and telling the story sort of reminded me that the start of it was I was listening to Sifyan Stevens' Christmas album because um, I'm a Jew who loves Christmas music. Um, and I was driving to Panera. Um, I was living at home with my mom at the time. This was in like 2019. I was driving to Panera, listening to the music. Cause, like that was all I was doing really. I didn't really have that much going on other than like a job I was working and driving to Panera for mac and cheese. And while I was driving, listening to Sifyan, I was like, oh my gosh, this like, music makes me feel so many things like and I was thinking about how it would be just such a great backdrop to a story but like I didn't ever want to write a Christmas story that like had people celebrating Christmas in a traditional way in it because that's not my experience um, right. so I was like okay what if I write a Christmas story with lesbian Jews because like in thinking about it I was also thinking about like as an American Jew you can't really separate Christmas from American culture like at all in any way because like mm -hmm. even if like you know there's those bumper stickers that are like keep Christ in Christmas and like all those different kinds of things but like it's an extremely almost secular holiday in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to the point where it's just like broader culture and if you're like a Jew or a non-Christian person you can't like you can't remove yourself from that when you're mm -hmm. living here so I think like Right. Like a lot of people have asked me like, oh, why'd you write a book with like Jews that takes place over Christmas? And it's like, well, because like we exist. If you like, live in America, America, you experience yeah. Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Whether you believe it or not from like right. setting aside the religious aspect of it, it's it's a cultural thing here. <laughs> yeah. And like there's like even a canonical like Jewish Christmas where like we all yeah. go see a movie and eat Chinese yep. food and eat like, Chinese that's food, dim sum. Like, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's like in the book as well. Cause obviously yeah. I couldn't like not have that be part of the book if I'm writing a book about like Jews celebrating, celebrating <laughs> Christmas, which they don't do, but like Jews right. during Christmas time. Um, so yeah, I think like that was part of it. And then the characters just kind of flowed from there I wanted to have two people who had sort of opposing views of what it was like to be a Jew during the Christmas season and I just wanted to write like something that felt like a like classic rom-com but with those types of characters that was the that was the origin I love that um that's I just I really do appreciate the way that you tap like 
the the Jewish experience during Christmas, like uh, my my mom's family is Catholic, but my dad's family is Jewish, so we kind of just did both things. But yeah. like you're right, it's it's like that weird thing where like I used to sort of be anti Christmas, of course, when I was growing up. I was like, yeah. eh, we're not gonna. Something. Now I'm just like fully embrace it. But like from that cultural aspect, like there is just. I don't know. There's it, it, the whole. It gives a whole feeling, the whole aesthetic, the whole vibe of Christmas. You yeah. know, is it's such a great setting for a rom com. Yeah. Like, I mean, we we all know like all the Hallmark ones. So exactly. I really love that you um, incorporated that. And like, tell me, tell me a little bit about, about this fossil stuff. Is it have anything to do with the fact that you major? What did you major? I wrote it down. Evolutionary, Evolutionary biology. biology. Yes. Yeah. I mean, is that where that comes from? <laughs> it definitely does. I mean, I have always been very, very into and fascinated by dinosaurs and paleontology. Like for a long time, I thought I wanted to be a paleontologist or at least like work in that field. Like I'm at school, I worked in a paleoecology lab and I worked at like a dinosaur fossil lab one summer. Like I've done a lot of, yeah, paleontological stuff. And then I also took an ichthyology class in college and which is fish for people who may yeah. be unfamiliar with the word ichthyology which is why paleo ichthyology dead dead fish fish fossils etc um and that's the word <laughs> the yes so I people have been like I don't ever want to say that word out loud but it's just paleo ichthyology and you can do it and I believe it. <laughs> um but anyway uh yeah I think like it came from so I kind of decided after a couple of years, Lainey Rose said, listen, I tried um, a couple of years of college that I do love biology, but maybe that wasn't going to be what I did for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so when I sort of pivoted to writing or podcast producing, I still like it, when I was doing podcast production, like I was doing a lot of scientific podcast production and I still do podcast production, but it's like, that's what I really like doing. And so like in whatever creative format I'm working in I want to incorporate like science and like things that I am passionate about so I just was thinking okay like you know not that there's like oh my god there's so many characters in books who are like paleontologists and study dinosaurs but like as someone who loves fish I was like okay what if she's a paleoichthyologist because also she studies coelacanths which that is how you say that word which did not know word. that <laughs> <laughs> and there is a, there's a pronouncer in the book. There's a point in the book where in a parenthetical, she goes, seal a can, like S-E-E, la can. And when I was uh, like, when the audiobook was happening and they were like, okay, can you send some like pronouncers? And I was like, they were like asking for some words and it didn't include coelacanth. And I was like, do you want me to send a voice message with me saying that word? Because if you mispronounce it, I will die a little inside. And they're like, no, no, we got it. And I was like, hey, so I'm sending this anyway. Like it's pronounced coelacanth. Like, thank you so much for doing my audiobook. I'm like, send that off. But what was I saying? Um, no, I think that's actually really smart. Like, I, I'm like just thinking about that. I'm like, I've never actually listened to the audiobook at first, so I don't know if they mispronounced anybody's name. But I'm like, <laughs> why didn't I even think of like sending a pronunciation guide for? I mean, hmm. <laughs> oh well, maybe I should listen to the audiobook. I don't know. No, don't. <laughs> I, don't know I can't. I can never listen to my own audiobook. Like, people have told me that for both my audiobooks, like the people who read it are very talented and read it well. Yeah. But like, it gives me an extreme amount of anxiety to hear yeah. my own words read back to me. Uh, and I don't want to know if anything is mispronounced. <laughs> um so hopefully it's not. ignorance is bliss <laughs> exactly exactly that is my my thought precisely um so I have a couple of random questions for you okay. um just a reminder to everybody if you have questions please yes. feel free to drop them in the Q&A we will be answering them shortly but break yes. the ice don't be scared and to ask feel free your questions. to utilize the chat there's going to be some trivia in which you'll have to utilize the chat if you want to participate oh. in the trivia so you know Talk all right chat. That, that's what i'm <laughs> saying it'll be corgi and coelacanth trivia so um go. corgi i mean we need to throw in some i got a little hello, border collie oh there goes the leg huh? oh yeah. yeah wait what's your doggy's <laughs> name uh her name is olive <laughs> oh my gosh give all um, that. all right so questions let's talk about some of your side characters here yeah um <laughs> especially i really want to know more about Beatrice the 96 okay. year old roommate <laughs> yes who inspired Beatrice <laughs> okay I told the story yesterday so I'll tell it 
today. You I have, have to, to tell it. Assume none of us were there yesterday. No, I know, but I, it's it's embarrassing for me to oh. tell the story. But oh, I'm now I want to know. It. No, because Beatrice is a real person. Like her name is different. Oh. Some of her her backstory is completely different. But Beatrice is based on almost entirely on a real human being who I lived with for a summer. Uh, who was 96 at the time. It's been about four years, so she's probably 100. Woo. Um, I do regularly check to see if uh, her obituary is listed online, and it hasn't been, so she is still alive. And I should definitely give her a call, and I definitely want to give her a call. Um, you should send her a copy of your book. Yeah, she's thanked in the acknowledgments. Aww. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I definitely, I would, I will. Um, she doesn't read that much. She likes to watch TV a lot. Um, so if it if ever gets turned into like a TV show or a movie, she could watch that. Um, and you know, five years down the line when she's 105. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she's based fairly tight, like not again, like a lot of the backstory is different. Her name is different. A lot of the circumstances of this are different, but she comes from very lovingly from a extremely kooky, lovely woman who I lived with for a summer How- in her boarding house. Basically. How did you come to yeah. find okay. was it so, Craigslist? Like right. it was actually it was Craigslist. Okay. So I changed it in the book. I was like, okay, well, Craigslist is too unbelievable. So I'll have her have met Beatrice from like in the book. Um, she's Shawnee's great grandmother's like friend. Um, so there's like a very loose okay. connection in the book. Okay. But in real life, there was no connection. It was literally Craigslist. And I called like her house and she was like, sure, like come live with me for the summer. And I was like, okay, okay. Like, do you want to know more about me? Like, do you want to know if I'm just inviting strangers from the yeah, internet? And she was like, no, like, that's okay. I was like, all right. <laughs> all she right. Didn't, she didn't put it on Craigslist. Her son, who was, you know, an, an older man, uh, put the listing on Craigslist. And she, but she answered the phone. What was that? I mean, I what was that like yeah (laughs) yeah I mean it was very similar to how I sort of describe Beatrice in the book um I mean it was sort of bizarre because she there there were multiple other people around my age who either went to um American University or mostly American because it was near American University in DC um she would like regularly want like she would just like knock on like it's true that I stayed in her like primary bedroom like she would knock on my door and like want to chat like I mean she wasn't sleeping there she slept in the attic like the house is literally the house from like the house there um is the house from how to excavate a heart um but yeah so she I don't know she is a wild person it was very it was weird she would like if I came home late one night Cause I was, I was at, I was working an NPR internship. And if I came home late, like make 10, she'd be like, where have you been? Like, are you safe? Are you okay? But like, Aww. she didn't know how to call me or feel the need to, but she, when I came in, she'd be like, okay, come on, like, let's talk. So she's looking out for you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's great that you have like a character in there that is somebody's looking out for, for yeah. Shani. Cause it's like, I think a lot, like one of the, like, you know, the jokes that people make about YA novels is like, where are the parents? Cause there's never any parents. And um, like, was Beatrice always in your, like, was she in your first draft? Yeah, she was always there. All the characters who are there were always there. There there. were some more characters who were there who have been cut, but all the characters who are there now were there. Um, Yeah, she was always going to be part of it um, in like a big major way. And I always, when I'm writing a first draft, I'll send my like, close friends a like google doc of it while I'm writing like not writing friends like close friends who know nothing about the writing industry but like who I trust and who I know will be like nice to me and they like all their comments were like I love Beatrice I am Beatrice can I play Beatrice in the movie like so like it it, I knew I could never cut her like I knew that she was gonna be integral to the book yeah that's great I just like I just like when there is an older sort of almost yeah like just if somebody's looking out for the main characters and why and like is like a positive role model in their life or not even a role model just somebody is like (laughs) yeah I wouldn't call Beatrice a role model (laughs) no not a role model yeah I was like not a role model just like somebody's checking in and like you know (laughs) yeah I mean I think like 
when people are like, oh, the parents are always absent in YA, like often there are like older characters who are helping them find their way or often there mm-hmm. are like, I think that's like a stereotype that's sort of outdated because I feel like in a lot of YA I've read recently, like parents have been fairly present or they're like a major plot, like the relationship between yeah. the parents and the child. But that's also like, plot. I mean, your book is set in college um, yeah. and like same with Fresh. So it's like, mm-hmm. that is a hallmark of, a co- the yeah. college experience is being away from your parents like that yeah. sort of like you know and m- building relationships maybe with adults that aren't like through your parents friends you know what I mean sure. like growing up before you get to college all the adults in your life are through like either your like your school or your parents friends so like when you're away on your own I think those in- those relationships are interesting and always kind yeah. of weird <laughs> yeah so. for sure <laughs> Um, so speaking of DC, because I know you mentioned DC earlier, um, (laughs) I was like, what what was I thinking when I wrote this question? I was like, um, (laughs) did you do research on, uh, the gayest DC dates? (laughs) Did I do research on the gayest DC dates? Um, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. (laughs) I wouldn't say I did research. Maybe lived experience is research. Okay. Um, okay. I didn't necessarily do research. Um, but yeah, I mean, museum dates are very gay. <laughs> there were a lot of museum dates. Um, I, I had a just... museum date with Fresh and Fresh that I had to cut. Yeah. But like, because I, like, I had to do research, I was like, gayest dates in Boston. Oh my God. <laughs> and I it's like, it's so Isabella funny. Stewart Gardner Museum. Like, where else, you know? <laughs> Um, no, I can't believe that you were made to cut or you had to cut a museum date yeah, scene because if did. you've read, if anyone in the chat has read this book or will read this book, uh, it's probably like 40% at least like museum dates <laughs> and museum content because like, A, that was like museums in DC are free. When I first moved there, I was like completely stoked by that fact. And then I lived there also during the government shutdown. And I was like extremely depressed because all museums shut down as well during the government shutdown. Um, and yeah, for me, I just think like it, it was such a big part of my experience living in DC. And also it's mm-hmm. just like the perfect lesbian date. Like you go, you like look at art, you like make jokes about it. You're like yeah. seeing maybe like old, like homoerotic art. Like it's very, yes. it's very, Museums are uh, hot. Museums are yes, so hot. Yeah. So I didn't, I can't say I Googled like what is the gayest date in DC. This all just came from my mind palace. Uh the portrait gallery is gay, yes. And it's very heavily featured in the book. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think like there's obviously other like queer spaces in DC, but like as someone I was living there before I turned 21, so it wasn't like I and these characters they go to the bars. Like, yeah, they yeah. go to the bars. They're not gonna do that kind of thing. So like right. museums are really like where you can go, kind of. They're like almost public space. I mean, they are technically public spaces in DC. Yeah, I, that's just so funny. Cause I like I didn't that didn't even occur to me when I was writing fresh that like they wouldn't go to a bar, but like of course they wouldn't go to a bar, you know? So like where yeah. else it's house parties or museums. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Like take a long walk. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I um switching gears here, I do have a more slightly more serious question. Okay. Um because this is a question that I get asked a lot with fresh and I noticed that you have like similar sort of some of the themes that you explore are similar and it's always the the thing that I'm talking about here is just a constant warning is like the sexual assault and like the trauma like sexual trauma and sort of working through that and how do you handle that in a story that is like supposed to be fun and joyous and funny and upbeat yeah. like how do you why did you decide to include that and how when you were writing it how did you make sure that like it didn't weigh the story down yeah also my cat has joined me oh yay the cat has entered the chat <laughs> um, he's all the way back there though um yeah I mean I think that's a good question also yeah I was thinking about this with fresh because you also have mm-hmm. like sexual assault in it and the character handling sexual assault and like the aftermath of that and like handle it very well um and I think it was more that I especially for like a queer story especially something set at a time when you're figuring things out um it felt 
like, first of all, you know, just like a story about lesbian Jews, there's gonna, it's, that sounds wrong, but like, there's always gonna be some amount of trauma, whether it's like generational trauma or like trauma that exists in their lives at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think like, it felt wrong to not include that. And also like, in my life, like the way I process like hard things is also through humor. So like, even when even yeah (laughs) like even though I hope this book is funny like I don't I didn't think that there couldn't be a storyline that deals with heavier topics because it almost makes the levity more like potent when there is something that is so serious because it a like is not surprising oh he's he's yeah I'm like like, (laughs) wandering toward me (laughs) like in the background um, I'm so distracted by him right now because um, <laughs> he's so cute. Um, yeah, I think like it A was like a way for me to process like my mm-hmm. own things and B mm-hmm. like it felt wrong to not include something that like is is not something that's talked about that much of like a queer person who is again and there is a content warning at the beginning of the book and I have on my website like content warnings of specific pages where this happens. Um, but like there is yeah like sexual assault of a character by like another queer person and I think like Mm -hmm. that's also a topic that's not really explored that much and like does happen um and like then this relationship is something that she that she gets into with May that is something that like could be healthy and is exciting and is something new is then like also more like it feels more important to her because she's had this bad relationship experience that when she has this experience where she knows she wants to be vulnerable and she knows she wants to let herself experience all the things that she can do with May like it is oh now your little puppy is there um I'm not like now I'm like distracted by pets but like yeah I don't know I think like it doesn't it feels to me like it's not hard to have or it's not wrong to have trauma in a book that is like a rom-com because every every book has serious subject matter and the book ends happily the book yeah. ends in a light way it's funny yeah. but like also there is this element in it because that is something that the character has experienced and that's something they're processing like during the book mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and I think it's, it was important that you like with Shawnee's journey through coming to terms with her sexuality and like what she wants out of sex, like post-trauma, like that healing process. And it's not, and like making sure that you let readers know that there's a distinction between like asexuality and like what Shawnee's going through and what Shawnee's going through is not, she's not asexual. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really important message to be putting in there. Um, I'm just, I'm, I, I always get really excited whenever I see like asexual themes and storylines, like, and just discussion yeah. ha- occur in yeah. YA because it's just, I feel like it doesn't happen that much, although it is happening a lot more now, thank God. Yeah. But like, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's nice to see in your story and handled so delicately and thank like, you. yeah, and, and it, it's done in like such a really well done way. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears again. <laughs> yeah. We got through that. We got through it. Cats and dogs and all. <laughs> yeah, thank you to my cat. He's literally. Do you see him? He's just loping yeah. right there. Both, both <laughs> the animals were like, "Oh no, our humans oh, are talking about yeah. <laughs> bad things." Oh. <laughs> um okay um I did not know this that you were a bagel person until Lainey was introducing you to um let's talk about bagels I'm a Jew from Long Island like obviously I'm a bagel person I'm a half Jew from Cincinnati so uh, so mm. (laughs) how are the bagels um, in Cincinnati Actually, they're really good because we have a lot of Bialis there so um shocking years but now that I'm in Portland there's no bagels here. There's that okay, wait, what's that one? I went was in Portland a little while ago and there's that one one place one. that's there's like a one. Jewish deli. There. It what is, is it's that it's place. It's like it's like called like the New York deli or whatever. Yeah. I've yeah, been there. Yes. Been yeah. there. I go it's get my box yeah, yeah, <laughs> and my yeah. pickles, my barrel pickles. Yeah. Um, but like there are like no bagels shops in Portland. It makes me so sad. Yeah. Um, what's your bagel of choice? 
Okay, and my big order is. Oh wait, we're gonna we're oh. gonna recreate um the the Negroni conversation here. Yes. So. Okay. <laughs> I was literally like debating. I was like, okay. should I just make a Negroni just for as like a yeah, bit? For it, but then I didn't. um. What's your what's your bagel of choice? Uh, a, a sesame bagel. Oh, stunning. With, <laughs> okay. with oh, I was gonna say the same thing. Un, oh, untoasted. <laughs> oh. With chive cream cheese. <laughs> oh, stunning. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. We need I to do that. this on TikTok like for real though. No, later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that was un, un unplanned. 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 <laughs> um wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm gonna it was really good. That it, you was did. Stunning. it was stunning. It was stunning. Um, yeah, we're everybody's saying that we need, should do it on TikTok. We're gonna we're gonna recreate this. We'll, we'll, we'll film it, it. we'll put it together. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it looks like we got a bunch of questions over in the okay. QA. So I'm gonna yeah. pop that up. Again, everybody, if you have not asked your questions, is this an AMA or any topics off limit, Jake? Uh no topics are off limits. Okay. I guess. But uh, yeah, no topics are off limits. Why not? <laughs> Okay, first question is from Ann Zhao. Um, besides, oh God, you told me how to pronounce it and now I can't pronounce it. What are, what is, sorry, now I saw a question and I'm scrolling. Beside so the, okay, what's, oh, coelacanth, coelacanth. Thank you, coelacanths. What are some of your favorite fish? Um, that's a great question. I would say, well, coelacanths are obviously up there for me. All lobe fin fish have a special place in my heart because they are like our, not our descendants, but they're like evolutionarily, like that's how terrestrial beings came to be. So coelacanth is a lobe fin fish. BRB Googling lobe fin fish me when I say anything. Um, <laughs> also, uh, the uh, the sunfish, the moa moa, um, if you haven't seen it, you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta give it a Google. Um, and sharks. I love those little guys. <laughs> um, my favorite fish is now the uh, lamprey eels. Yes, love. Love. Um, I just got to experience lamprey eels for the first time like last week randomly. Um, uh, what do you so mean experience? Um, a friend of mine to experience them. I went and picked up two of them um, with a friend who's like a PhD. She's like an animal science person. And she's like, do you want to come pick up lamprey fish with me? Drive out like three hours east oh of Oregon. And I was like, okay. So we had like a cooler full of lamprey fish that we had to like check on because they like kept popping up the lid um, to try to get out. So I was on like lamprey that duty. Is <laughs> no, that is actually not. That's not for me. Um, that's why Shawnee studies dead fish because so we have found your fish line. Oh my Wait. god, that's yep. really really frightening. <laughs> I have to be honest. Okay, here's my suggestion. We'll do two questions and then we'll do a mm -hmm. uh, trivia and then we'll do two questions and we'll do trivia. How's that? So, sound? Okay, sounds great. All right. Um. Okay, next question comes from Reagan. Um, where is your favorite place to get bagels in DC? Okay, the answer to this, which was, I was there just before, was recommended this place by a friend, hadn't tried it, then I tried it, and it's actually really, 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 really good. It's called Bagels Etc. It's cash only, it's at DuPont Circle. It's run by like three extremely lovely Korean women and they make like the best bagels so fast. So that's my recommendation. Amazing. All right, now we got, now you gave us a fish trivia. Okay, yes. Okay, so here's, everyone's gonna have to answer in the chat and Margaret, you can answer out loud. So this is my question. In what year was the coelacanth rediscovered? Because as we know, it was people, it was originally thought to be extinct we know if we if in the book I do explain this so just letting people know so when was it rediscovered it's going to be multiple choice so everyone answer a b c or d okay you what it what is how can I google no do not please do not google no googling no cheating. Not, not googling excuse me okay. no cheating a 1653 b 1763 c 1938 or d 1817 I'm going with D. Okay, are you looking at the chat? No, I'm just going based on my limited okay. knowledge of when Audubon was doing a bunch of his bird research. <laughs> okay, the answer is C, uh, oh! 1938. Um, it was rediscovered, though there had been off the coast of South Africa, though like people who were living in South Africa had like 
it was trawled constantly um like by them and they were like oh we didn't know that this fish was like valuable or had been extinct but like we, we always throw it back because you can't eat a seal can that doesn't taste good so good job chat i'm sorry margo <laughs> I was only one off, one letter off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you were, that was the second closest century wise. You were only like 100 years off. Yeah, so Price is Right rules, I didn't go over. So that's true, that's true. Well, none of them were over, though. So. Just let me have this. Okay, okay. I need this. I need All right. this. <laughs> Should we do another question from the QA? All right, we got another question from the QA. Um, this is from Alice. If you could create the, the perfect romantic wintertime holiday that doesn't already exist, what would it be celebrating and or honoring and what ritual would it have? Oh my gosh. Okay. That's such a great question. And I wish I could have thought about this. Margaret, do you have any thoughts? Let's see. I think my holiday would be like it. I mean, the best parts of winter holidays are you see your friends mm -hmm and family if you like your family but mostly I think this would be like a friend holiday yeah. you get to eat a lot of good food if that's your jam and you're like cozy in your pajamas so maybe it's like maybe it's like an event where like you just like hang out with like for a week you like go to a different friend's house in your pajamas and like you bring so it would be, then I would say yours should be like a four day yeah holiday that's December 26th yes. through December 30th. Yeah. And it's not necessarily romantic, but you could obviously bring your significant other to these events. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I'm like, <laughs> one of those days should be set aside for boning, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, mine is actually, I do have a winter holiday that I that oh. I celebrate. Um, I celebrate Darwin Day, which is February 12th. Um, Instead, I don't celebrate Valentine's Day, so I do Darwin Day instead. So it's like day of um, everybody, like celebrating evolution. Oh my <laughs> and God, that's perfect for this. And the traditional <laughs> gifts on Darwin Day um, are a plant and Love. pizza. And a finch. <laughs> that's amazing. Say, yeah, I'm going to have to start salt. Yeah, a plant and pizza. That that's what that's that how I. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. this is that. That's that's done. I'm I'm in. I'm celebrating <laughs> it. Um. All right. One more question from the Q and A before yes. we do another trivia. Um. Priya asks, "What does your writing process look like?" Oh, Priya, it really depends. Um, <laughs> my writing process looks like I get an idea that I'm super excited about, and then if I'm able to continue that excitement, I can write. A first draft is something in a very quick period of time and then it's a constant struggle from there on out for the next year or however long to actually go back and revise it and put it into a condition that is somewhat suitable um, for me <laughs> and for anyone to read so it really just becomes a struggle i don't have a writing uh schedule necessarily and um i don't know no. if i ever can but i do I do want to be able to write regularly more, especially than I have been. But when I am actively drafting, often it's like very all consuming. So it often is like bursts of a lot of writing and then like months or weeks where I'm like not really writing as much and I'm just like doing other things or thinking about writing and like feeling bad that I'm not writing. Um, so that's kind of my writing process. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we had... Right. We got a seal account questions. So now we're going to move to a corgi question. I'm okay. emotionally prepared. Let's do okay. this. What language does the word corgi come from? Does it come from Gaelic, Welsh, English, or Spanish? And that would be A, B, C, D. I'm going, going B, Welsh. Okay. All right. Looks like there's a consensus in the chat. Oh, except a couple of people. Okay. It is B. And if, that's why I didn't say the Pembroke Welsh Corgi, because that might be yeah. the way. There is a bit contentious, but some say it combines, oh, you cheated your dad as Welsh. Um, also, love the Welsh people, love the Welsh country. I'm so um, 
so much more into it than uh, England, just letting everyone know. Um, okay, and apparently, also, I did see someone who's a Shots Welsh language. Shots fired! Shots fired! <laughs> I saw someone who's a Welsh language TikToker explain what the plural of corgi is, but I can't, I don't remember, and I'm going to try to find it, like, post it on my social media, because it's not corgis, and, like, the Welsh language, it, like, has a, whatever the Welsh pluralizing form is, but it apparently combines the Welsh word core, which means to gather, or potentially dwarf, and gi, which is, like, a Welsh form of dog, so oh. that is why... It, it means Mikey, Mikey, Mikey over here. Yeah, your little gi. Oh, <laughs> that, that was the corgi trivia. <laughs> That's, That's a good piece of trivia. trivia. Thank you. Like okay. Um, Next question. Oh, yeah, it was like corgwin. Yeah, that's like the plural. I don't think it's pronounced the way I'm saying it, but yes. I was going to say, of course, it, you know, with the Welsh, it's like they have a thing against vowels. So, like, it's like, yeah. it's going to be like a bunch of <laughs> corgoon. Corgoon. Thank you. That's a good one. <laughs> I would name a corgi corgoon. Corgoon. Um, my dog's nemesis um, in New York when we lived in New York was a corgi named Puccini, like after the composer, Puccini. but spelled pooch, like P-O-O-C-H. Puccini. That's a little too twee for my taste. I know. That's why my dog and Puccini did not get along. <laughs> It was, a corgi named Crab Rangoon. That's a oh, really good one. So Crabby, a good one. Crabby as a nickname. That's really, oh, that's really good. My favorite alcohol, alcohol is called Crabby's. <laughs> there you go. It's have. ginger beer. It's, it's really good. good. Um, okay, Catherine asks, who would you want to play Shawnee and A in a film adaptation of your book? Someone asked me this yesterday, and I said two random. 18 year old Jews who are un- yet <laughs> undiscovered because that's really what I want. But I'll let you know who I was thinking of in my head as like, which mm. I never face cast. Like that's not usually a thing I do at all. But I did have an idea of what man Shawnee looked like in my head. And Shawnee, here I'll just do a little. Shawnee to me was like a young Alia Shaw cat, even though I think she's half yes. Iraqi and not Jewish, but the half Iraqi just sort of blends the vibe. Um, and for Shawnee, or sorry, for May, I was thinking a young Rachel Vice who is Jewish and also very hot. Um, she's so hot. <laughs> I just watched okay, her, that, that Jewish lesbian film, film Disobedience, that she's what? in with uh, Rachel, Mc- Rachel McAdams and Rachel Vice oh, and a Jewish lesbian. What? I yeah. Get to go. Sorry, Disobedience? I'm writing it down right yes, now. Yes. I don't, know, I don't so... know anything. It is okay. Why so did like, come out. Um, oh like in twenty nineteen. Why did no one tell me about this? It is okay. So Rachel Vice is like she's like sort of like an ex um like Orthodox Jew, and she like somebody in her family dies, so she has to go back to England, like where all her family is, and it's like she had this relationship with uh, Rachel McAdams when they were younger, but like now Rachel, you know, like unspoken. And then like, there's all this tension because like she's back. I feel literally, I'm not going to lie. I feel betrayed by my friends, family, by my followers that I, maybe everyone assumed I had heard oh. of it, but I'm going to literally watch this tonight after I catch up on last night's episode of Survivor. Oh my God. A- Super hot sex scene, just warning you. No, <laughs> is... okay, I'm ready. I want to watch it. Chris, as we assumed. <laughs> it is hot. Everybody who's in the comments right now who's seen it, they know. They okay. know. Okay, everyone, we got to watch it. Everyone who's seen it, we I can't believe you haven't seen it. It's so good. Yeah, this, this, is, is, this is shocking information. It must have just slipped right by me. Maybe I like You know what? It, Actually, I think it, it came out when you were drafting this book, so that's yeah. probably why you missed it. <laughs> yeah, I was like very Yeah, Disobedience Watch Party tonight literally. Yes, um, I think it's on Hulu. It's Oh my god, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um okay. Um Alana asks Taylor Swift song that describes the book. Uh, I knew someone was going to ask this. Are I you a Swiftie? Know. I'm not a Swifty, but I, I do okay. I do have respect and love and admiration for Taylor Swift. Um, and then which which musician are you a fan of, and then we can do a song from? Um, well, I well the the soundtrack of this book is like Haim and Muna. Yeah, of um, course. <laughs> and so uh, for like the Muna song "Winter Break" is literally like the plot of this book. So if you haven't listened to it, you should listen to the song "Winter Break." The, previous title was winter break of this book 
It's funny because if I was going to write a book, like a Christmas set book based on an album, a Christmas album, like literally when you were describing it at the beginning of our chat, I kept thinking Mannheim Steamroller, like like the like electronic Christmas like music that my mom would blast while like yelling at all of us, like to clean up the house while our relatives came over. Like that would be, it would be like Christmas hell. That's amazing. Um, okay, okay, we got two questions, questions, so it's trivia okay. time. Okay, question. What do you what do you want next? Corgi or coelacanth trivia? I only have one more corgi, but I have two more coelacanth. So maybe I'll do maybe I'll do coelacanth. Let's okay. do coelacanth. Okay. okay, here's something fun. These are these next two are like it are recent more. It's like scientific information that wasn't out when I was writing this book about coelacanth. So my book is already outdated in terms of coelacanth facts. Okay, so the question is, how long do coelacanths carry their young? What is their gestational period? The question, okay, so A, one month, B, five years, C, one year, or D, 10 years? I'm going to go with D because it sounds insane. Okay. All right. I'll let some of the question, the answers in the chat roll in. Okay. This one's fairly split. And uh, the answer is B, uh, five years, which is the longest known gestational period of any animal. Any what? They're carrying those little babies for uh, five years. This poor seal can't. It's I know. So long. <laughs> it's so long. It's a really long time, but also it's like little eggs. Like they're okay, but it is a long. All right. time. and they're they're a big Dang. fish. So. All right. Yeah. Wow. That's an... I learned something new every day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Someone okay. said those babies come out like full-grown kindergartners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Next, we've got Haley asks: Were there any characters you had a particularly hard? Whoop! There we It jumped down. Uh, were there any characters you had a particularly hard time writing and or developing? Ooh. Um. I would say generally no, but for me, writing May the love interest was probably the most challenging part just because I knew that she was also like hurting, but I didn't necessarily know why when I started writing the book. And it took a while to get to the point where she has a lot of stuff going on with her dad. She has like a, like previous, like very intense female friendship that was maybe more that didn't quite work out. And like, I think it can't, it took like a few drafts before I understood like May in a more, in like a deeper way because she was always very angry. Like she's angry in the final draft. She's angry in this version and she was angry in the first draft. But I think initially it was like, okay, why is she so angry? Mm. But as I was writing, I like sort of understood her anger more because both Shawnee and May are both kind of angry people, but like in very different ways um, where like Shawnee is more like sarcastically angry and like loudly angry and may is sort of more like internally they're like externally to shawnee but brooding like, yeah sort of brooding. yeah so everything's think- internal whereas shawnee everything is external yeah so i think it took a little longer to sort of understand like why may was like that for me but like i always knew sort of like the i always knew the outcome but i didn't always know the reason and i think like finding that was like a fun process because it did feel like oh she is like a person who i know and i'm like building her out and i'm like understanding more about her because it wasn't like oh i had to think about it it would be like oh yeah like while i was writing i was like oh this totally makes sense that like this this and this or why like this this and this which i'm not saying exact thing is because they're like i don't know plots of the book that are maybe spoilers but yeah yeah so that's the answer to that one um catherine asks any tips or advice on how to balance writing with a full-time yeah. job no um uh I can't do it it's extremely tough for me it sucks um I work a couple like part-time things like I'm a part-time bookseller and like a part-time audio freelancer and a writer and um I don't know how to do it uh I the days I work I come home sort of exhausted the days I'm writing I feel sort of unmotivated um so if you have any tips for me that would be great mine um practical tip is I just wrote in fresh entirely to monster energy drink, the white can specifically. Okay. Um, okay. Cause I work full time. And so it's like, I had no energy, none, yeah. no energy when I get home, but like pop one. <laughs> okay, like, the biology what? major in me is like, please for your heart. If you are listening do not do, do what Margot 
done. Yeah, so, so I, I take, take my Adderall. Adderall says. I take my Adderall and then drink a monster energy drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on the brink, on the of, brink of a heart, of a heart attack, attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then right, and yeah. then right. Like okay. just when I'm sweaty enough, where I feel like I've got a nine one one on dial, that's yeah. when you start writing. Okay, <laughs> so I love that, and I want to find a way to get myself to that state because um, I would love to feel that euphoria. <laughs> But yes. I don't necessarily know. Um, I think we've been we've been ignoring Anne's question, oh. um, which is, would the characters of How to Actually Beat a Heart get along with characters of Almost Flying? Who would get along best and worst? And my answer to that is, I think they would get along because in Almost Flying, there are like older queer characters in it, as like mm-hmm. older as in like they're like basically YA protagonist age and the main characters are tweens. So I think that like Shawnee and May would get along well with like Dhruv and Alexa uh, and Sarah. Um, But like they, I think all would like, they're very different types of people. I mean, Alexa is very angry. So I think she'd get along well with May. Um, I think Dhruv would get along well with Shawnee because they're both kind of annoying. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But like extremely lovably annoying, but like very annoying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think like also like Sarah and Alexa would go on a double date with Shawnee and May. Um, I like to imagine that, that my characters all sort of are vibing together um, in their own little world. <laughs> That's really sweet. Um, all right. Um, wait, let's, trivia, let's, trivia. Well, we have one more Q&A question. question. We can answer that and then we'll do, we'll finish up your trivia. We'll story. do all the trivia. Okay. All right, Christine asks, if you had an author cameo in a film adaptation of How to Excavate a Heart, what would it be? Okay, I've literally thought about this, and I think it would be, so there's a scene, New Year's Eve, there's a party in, like, a Georgetown uh, brownstone, and I would be, like, a party goer. I think that would be very fun. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. I've thought about that with Fresh. Um, There's, like, a, a sex montage, and... Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would want to be one of the randos that she hooks oh up God. with in the sex montage. <laughs> oh but I'm too old, so yeah, I'm just gonna be, be like, okay, maybe that. I'll just be a teach. I'll be one of the professors in a random <laughs> background scene. Um, I love that. Where, where in Love Simon were you? Um. Oh my God. Okay. So they gave me. I had like there were there were two options for me. One was I was going to be um a student. Oh, my guy is grooming. Um, <laughs> I really wanted to be in the Waffle House scene. That was like yes. the one I really, I really, yeah. cause I was going to be like a Waffle House waitress. Um, but yeah. we couldn't, they like removed their schedule around. And so when I flew in, that wasn't the scene that they were filming that day. Yeah. So I didn't end up getting to do that. So I am in the background, um, where they're all out having lunch in the courtyard when they're planning the very first party when like Simon and Blue or, well, you're almost blue, but yeah, spoiler. Yeah. Um, oh, spoiler like, first. Spoiler first. Like, so yeah. like whatever. <laughs> um, but they're talking about Oreos for like they they like love of Oreos for the first time. So yeah. I'm in the background of that, and then I'm in a cafeteria scene later. But yeah, that was fun day. Was I love really that. Day. That's so yeah. cool. Um, okay, so the next question is, um. Okay, this is a Corgi trivia question. So everyone, get ready. Get your head in the game for Corgi trivia. When were the aboriginal form of Corgi first brought to Wales? This is like the Corgi ancestor. When were those dogs brought to Wales? Because now we know they're Welsh. Here are the options. Oh, I wrote down all the options, but I don't remember what the answer is. Wait, no, oh my I do, God. I do. Okay. No, 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 I do, I do. <laughs> I just remembered. I was like looking and I realized it. Okay, okay, A, 500 CE, like com- common era, current current time that we're in, post, post-Christ, post as some <laughs> like to say, uh, 1200 BCE, before common era, 3000 BCE, or 1800, common era. 1800. Sorry. Common era? <laughs> common era. Okay. I'm going D. You all I'm think that the Aboriginal Corgi ancestor was brought to Wales in 1900. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> the answer is B. It's probably not that. Yeah. <laughs> 1200, 1200 BCE. Um, I just, I think. How do we know that? How do we know that? Because I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> but also, like 1900. Not to be like this is why your answer is silly. But like the queen, 
How, like this is like not like corgi and its current. I said eighteen hundred, not 1900. or eighteen hundred. Sorry, the, okay. the corgi in its current form. I don't know when exactly that came out. This was like this was like branches off of evolution from the corgi. Okay, so okay, not like the purebred that we know no, today. No, 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 no. But yeah, so the answer to that is twelve thousand BC, and okay. also it is the ancestor of the dachshund. So that same dog. That so makes they're, sense. They're pretty closely related. Have you ever thought that about makes sense? Uh, Dachshund and a Great Dane, and whether or not they could have sex. Have I thought about this extensively? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, constantly. Yeah. I think about this a lot. <laughs> oh, I think they brought to Wales, but where? From where? That's it. Let me find the. You know, this was not. This was a sketchy article. We can all do our own research after this. This <laughs> hey, the corgi come with resources. Come with sources. Sorry. Yeah. The, the corgi <laughs> facts. The corgi facts are not as well researched as the fish facts. I have to say. Um, there's some if they can they can if the great Dane is the mum well i think they could do it either way but they would probably have to cut the babies out of the dachshund because there's some dogs where they have to get c-sections like they can't give birth right. naturally because they're so fucked up um okay so the last question is how long is a seal can't lifespan the first option is roughly a century the second option is roughly 30 years. The third option is it's unknown. And the fourth option is roughly 200 years. Now you have well, some information. You have the gestation. Yeah, we know it's like at least five. <laughs> at least five, yeah. At least five. <laughs> um, so throw your answers in the chat. Let's see. Someone's saying D. You gotta come I'm, gonna go with, I'm gonna go with unknown. Unknown, okay. All right, well, previously it was unknown. But it is recently found out as of 2021, roughly a century. So the answer is A. Oh my God. <laughs> Throwing my phone. <laughs> oh, see how we would have won this if it had been see two high, years ago. See <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Incredible. That was probably my favorite event that we have <laughs> in months. You both are an absolute delight. <laughs> so much for not only like a very touching conversation, but also a very funny conversation. <laughs> much like our books, like we were saying. Yeah, if you think we're funny, buy our books from East City Bookshop. They have yes. book plates and art. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This has truly been such a delight, so much fun. Um, and like I, like Margo said, please, if you want a copy of How to Excavate a Heart or Almost Flying or Fresh, we do have all copies at the store and we can ship anywhere in the country. Um, and uh, and you got book plates and art uh, that I have sent and will deliver more of whenever is needed. <laughs> <laughs> Art is really so good. Um, I have yeah. a, I have a copy of it right here. Here it is. Oh, I got look it. At I got that. it. It looks so good. It's so good. There we go. <laughs> I love I love good lined art, man. It's so good. Oh yeah. There we go. I'm doing the influencer hand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us tonight, and um, we will see you around for the next event. Thanks so much for having us, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yes, and thank you, East City and everyone. <laughs> Congrats, Jake, on your release. Yay! Thank you, thank you, thank you Margo. All right. <laughs>